I'd like to discuss a very, very important hormone called growth hormone in relationship to how to increase it, especially as you age. Unfortunately, as we age, growth hormone just really tanks. If you're over 65 years old, your growth hormone is likely to be 65% lower than what it should be. And growth hormone in an adult versus a child works completely differently. So if you don't have enough growth hormone as a kid, you're going to be shorter. But in an adult, it has everything to do with protein synthesis. I'm talking about muscle building, uh, building of your tendons, your ligaments, your collagen, your joints, and your bones. Now, what's pretty wild about this is that the levels of growth hormone in someone over the age of 60 are equivalent to someone younger with a growth hormone deficiency pathology or some dysfunction with the pituitary gland because the pituitary gland makes growth hormone. So a lot of people are deficient in growth hormone and they don't connect the dots on what that's doing to their body. They're gonna have a difficult time building muscle. A growth hormone also has everything to do with fat burning, the breaking down of lipids or fats, primarily in your midsection. So someone with lower growth hormone is gonna have a problem with muscle building. They're gonna have cognitive issues usually have a lowered mood relating to either depression or anxiety. They may have higher levels of LDL, hair loss, and insomnia. But growth hormone, and typically an adult, uh, helps you with protein, very similar to testosterone. So not only does growth hormone go down as you age, testosterone also goes down as well. So growth hormone is produced by the pituitary gland that's in your brain. And that hormone signal comes down and works through your liver initially. And it works with this other thing. It's like a hormone. It's called insulin-like growth factor, number one. Now, it sounds kind of a strange name, but basically you can think of that very similar to growth hormone because it has very similar functions, except for growth hormone has a more potent effect on fat burning, whereas IGF-1 or insulin growth factor number one has a weaker effect on fat burning. Now, there's a very important reason why I brought that up because I'm going to be talking about the liver in just a minute, but I just wanted to give you the general function of what growth hormone does. Professional athletes that take human growth hormone uh, when probably they're not supposed to because it's illegal in many different sports, and it does have a lot of side effects, but that doesn't seem to discourage certain athletes from taking it. And there's a lot of people taking other types of things to try to stimulate growth hormone. I'm going to focus more on the natural ways that will keep you out of trouble that don't have side effects. What blocks growth hormone? The biggest thing is insomnia, especially if you have sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a situation where you're, you have this obstruction in your back of your, your sinus cavity or maybe the back of the throat for some reason, and you're not able to get enough oxygen. There's some interesting connection between getting enough oxygen when you're sleeping, right, in order to sleep. So if we have this imbalance and we're not getting enough air, we're not going to be able to get enough sleep. Growth hormone is mostly elevated during the first part of deep delta wave sleep. So if you don't get that, you're not going to be able to have the, the benefit of growth hormone. In fact, they tested people with sleep apnea and their growth hormone is much, much lower. And even when they wear a CPAP machine and they get more oxygen, okay, that's that mask over their their nose where they're in their mouth where they're getting oxygen, their growth hormone comes back to where it should be, which is interesting. So if you can fix sleep apnea, you can greatly increase growth hormone. When you're in a room, when the windows are not open and you're not getting enough oxygen because maybe you don't also have enough plants in your room which give you oxygen, you may have a tendency to have more CO2 in that room. And just that alone can affect your sleep in a negative way. And this is why when you open the window, if you can, or you get a plant next to where you're sleeping, you can definitely sleep better, just for the fact that you're increasing the oxygen and you're lowering the CO2. So many people are spending all day in a room with a higher level of CO2 and not enough oxygen. So this uh, greatly higher CO2 situation can affect cognitive function, uh, especially if you're like a student and you're taking a test and you're trying to have the best uh, intelligent focus that you can. Well, having this imbalance of CO2 and oxygen can greatly affect that, but it also majorly affects your sleep. 
The next thing that really messes up growth hormone is something called hyperglycemia. That's too much sugar in the blood from a high carbohydrate diet, or let's say you're a diabetic. That can inhibit growth hormone. And there's a lot of things that you can do to fix that, like going on a low carb diet. But what you need to know is that one common way that growth hormone is suppressed is through either high sugar or high insulin. Now, this insulin topic is very interesting because high level of insulin will suppress growth hormone the same as a severe deficiency of insulin. So we really need to have normal insulin. And this is maybe a confusion that a lot of people have with keto. They think that they need to bring insulin down to zero because insulin is really, really bad. No, insulin is really necessary. It's a normal hormone. We want it normal. We don't want it too high or too low. And unless you're a type 1 diabetic and have you know loss of the, the cells that produce insulin, usually when you are a diabetic or a pre-diabetic, not type 1, but type 2, you can have a situation where you have high level of insulin and low level of insulin at the exact same time. Now, how can that be? Well, because the body develops this resistance. So in this receptor, um, you have this blockage. So the insulin comes out triggered by carbs, goes into the receptor. The receptor is blocking it, so we have low insulin inside the cell. The feedback loop actually tells the pancreas to produce more, so now we have the situation where we have more and more and more insulin. And over time, the insulin becomes so weak that it can't regulate the blood sugars anymore because the pancreas is exhausted. So one really simple way to know if you have a severe insulin deficiency is this. You want to do a test a fasting blood glucose test. You don't even have to go to the doctor. You can just get a kit at the local drugstore uh, or buy it online, but it's a blood test kit and you test while you're fasting. Maybe like when you wake up in the morning. Normally it should be around, you know, 75, 80. If that blood sugar is higher, okay, let's say it goes up to, you know, 100, 115, 120, things like that, then you know you have a deficiency of insulin. Think about it. What's happening when your blood sugars are going up? You don't have enough insulin to suppress the blood sugars because that's what insulin does. Anytime your blood sugar goes up, you don't have enough insulin. And that could be created from this insulin resistance situation. And one really interesting thing about a diabetic on a good portion of their high blood sugar, it may not be 100% from the diet. In fact, it's not. A good portion of their high sugar is because the liver is making too much glucose. It's making out of protein and even fat and even ketones. So that brings up the next point that I want to talk about. The pituitary gland, as one of its functions, is the production of growth hormone. And if you think about these hormones, they're made by glands. Hormones are communications that travel between different points, right? From the pituitary to the liver. And then also there's a feedback loop that comes back to turn it off. So you have this entire communication going on. And my thought uh, is not to replace the message or the hormone with some synthetic version. Instead, why don't we actually support the gland that actually makes growth hormone? It's a new concept for a lot of people, but it's much, much wiser because that way you don't mess with this uh, hormone that can then shut down the gland. So anytime you take any type of hormone replacement, whether it's estrogen or even testosterone or even growth hormone, you end up causing the gland that makes it to go to sleep. It atrophies, it shrinks, it doesn't work anymore. So one really important thing I think would be good to increase your growth hormone, especially if you notice a loss of muscle and these other issues I mentioned, is to take a pituitary glandular support. One that I like, and I'm not affiliated with this company, I don't get any kickbacks or anything, but it's standard process, their pituitrophin product, PMG. This is something I used in practice. It seems to work good, not by giving you growth hormone, because they take the hormones out, but by giving you the raw materials to support the gland that makes your own growth hormone. And a lot of people have reported back that they sleep better and their nails and hair starts growing back much better. So you might want to make a mental note of that. Also stress. A little bit of stress is good for the growth hormone, but chronic stress, right? 
it can really inhibit your growth hormone. But intermittent stress is good, as in exercise, intense exercise, has the ability to stimulate growth hormone up to 2,000%. And I'm talking about sprinting as the most intense uh, can help someone increase growth hormone. If you have a liver problem, okay, as in a fatty liver or an inflamed liver, or even a liver that has cirrhosis, that can really mess with your growth hormone. So anything that can improve liver function will help growth hormone. And I'm talking about milk thistle. That's probably one of the best things you can take to improve many different aspects of your liver. I mean, it's kind of like something that actually counters uh, poisoning in your liver, whether it's you know from Tylenol poisoning or a snake bite or poisoning from mushroom. Milk thistle counters that, but it has a lot of other cool things it can do as well. And from a diet standpoint, moderate protein can help increase growth hormone. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Sounds like the ketogenic diet, right? Now, what type of protein is best? The most bioavailable complete protein, the protein that has basically the, the best concentrated amino acids, uh, red meat, eggs, fish, all of that is really, really good. And also red meat and other types of meat are loaded with zinc. And if you're zinc deficient, you're also gonna be low in growth hormone as well as testosterone. So you wanna make sure you do the healthy version of the ketogenic diet, which includes all of these nutrients, like all the trace minerals to help. Now, when you exercise, okay, I've talked a lot about doing the cold immersion or even a cold shower to help increase uh, anti-aging factors and things like that. But cold therapy also increases something called heat shock proteins, which increase growth hormone. Heat, as in a hot shower or a sauna or a whirlpool or a jacuzzi, will also increase growth hormone significantly, even more than cold therapy, okay? So heat therapy will increase growth hormone by a factor of 1,500%, which is even more than exercise. So this is why I'm bringing this up, because maybe you can combine it. And also, this heat will help you sleep at night, which will automatically increase your growth hormone. But I'm not talking about when you're in the bed staying warm. I'm talking about sometime during the day getting a sauna. Because at night, you want to keep the room a bit cooler. You're going to sleep better. And maybe you just sleep with a sheet or something like that. And the other aspect of growth hormone is to do intermittent fasting. It's actually very, very potent. I'm not talking about necessarily lowering your calories, especially if you're trying to build muscle. I'm recommending to keep the same amount of calories, but just eat them less frequently. So if you did two meals and you did enough calories and you didn't snack, you have the ability to increase growth hormone by 2000%, which is pretty fascinating. I want to just bring up the topic of your muscles. Okay. Sometimes people, when they get on the ketogenic diet, they feel that the muscles are just flat. They kind of lost their size. They look dehydrated. Because um, when you do keto, at least initially, you lose your glycogen stores. Glycogen is basically the storage of glucose, a lot of water, and potassium. And when you initially cut down your carbs, okay, you're going to also use up some of your glycogen reserve. And you're going to lose water weight. okay, And uh, then your body's going to burn more fat. You're going to get leaner. But how do we handle this flat muscle situation? Well, here's how you would handle it. Uh, there's a real interesting study with athletes, okay, that do keto. And apparently there's no glycogen difference in their muscles versus someone who's not doing keto. They have the same amount of glycogen. Now, think about what happens with an athlete. They have to use this glycogen initially to run a certain way. And then if they're fat adapted, they can convert over to burning fat. And they burn three times as much fat as anyone else. They're like a fat burning machine. But what if you're not an athlete, okay, and you're not using up this glycogen to then cause your body to replenish it? You might have lower amounts of glycogen. Well, number one, make sure you consume enough fluid with the electrolyte potassium and sodium. Very, very, very important to keep the hydration of the muscle because we want to avoid this carb loading bodybuilders do where they basically just eat a lot of refined carbs and they just fill up the muscle with glycogen, which is a lot of its water. So it makes the muscle look fuller. We don't want to do that because that comes with a package. It creates problems with insulin resistance, but at the same time, we don't want to look dehydrated. 
So we want to make sure that the electrolytes, including sodium and potassium, are consumed with enough fluid. And maybe if you have a problem with this, you need to bring your carbs up to 50 grams. So that would be roughly about three cups of uh, berries per day. But we don't want to just do any like straight sugar because that's going to inhibit our growth hormone. So I've given you a lot of different things you can do related to growth hormone. And there's a lot more to learn about this. But if you have not seen this video on how to help someone with sleep apnea, that would be a really good one to watch. I put it up right here.